Welcome to Victory Church Craddock. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. There's that thing of the, the Israelites when they were on the eastern side of the Jordan River and they were going to go across the Jordan into the promised land. And uh, the Bible says that God spoke to Joshua and he said to the priests that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant that they must step into the raging river. That river was in flood at that time, if you go and read the history. But as they stepped out in faith and put their foot into the water, so God stopped up the water. And they were able to cross over on dry ground. And for some of you this morning, even those that stood, I just feel God is saying it's time for you to take a risk. Time for you to step into the water. Things are not going to happen automatically for you. There is something that you and I have to do. And so if you've got an unfulfilled dream or a vision or a hope for your business, for your family, whatever it is, and God's given you a word, I'm encouraging you this morning to step in to that with courage. I'm encouraging you to step with courage. Sounds good, eh? All the English teachers here, I don't know if my grammar was right. But I just want to encourage you this morning to step into everything that God's got for you. Start walking in it. If God has said so, then I believe it and I start walking into it. And we do it by the help of the Holy Spirit. We don't do it because we think it's a good idea and we've come up with some concoction of how we're going to do it. We say, Holy Spirit, I want to walk into my, my destiny. How do I do it? And as soon as he starts telling you what to do, you start moving and you start walking. And eventually you'll start running into the vision and the dream and the purpose that God's got for you. Does that sound good? Beautiful. So this morning what I want to do is I want to continue um, from last Sunday when I spoke on the perfect love of God. Um, Don't you love those songs we sang? The one was, oh, how sweet it is to be loved by you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet it is to be loved by the creator of the universe. Oh, how sweet it is to be loved by the one who gave you breath. How sweet it is to be loved by Jesus. I absolutely love that song and um, honey from the rock, water from the stone. Isn't that what the Israelites depended on when they were in the desert? And even for some of you, you might feel like you're in a bit of a dry place with the Lord this morning. I want to encourage you to drink water from the rock. And we know that the rock is Jesus. Sounds good. So please open your Bibles to the book of Romans. I just think that... uh, this, this whole thing of the woman that um, Alreen spoke about this morning was beautiful. And, uh, and I do want to just pray that the Priscilla's and the Dorcas's would rise and fulfill the mandate that God's got specifically over women we felt this morning. And, uh, and that woman would rise and be everything that God has called you to, be it in your community or in your family, uh, your place of work, whatever it is. We just speak favor over women in Jesus' name. So if you've got your Bibles... And you're in Romans chapter, what did I give you a chapter? No, you just opened your Bibles. Beautiful people, aren't you? Romans chapter 5. So, so people might often ask us, I'm a new Christian and I've just started reading the Bible. Where's a good place to start? I always think that the best place to start is the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Simply because it it's expresses the love of Jesus. And, and John captured the life of Jesus very well. And if you and I want to be Jesus' followers, I want to encourage you to go and read the book of John. After that, you want to understand what Christian living is all about, go and read the book of Romans. Romans is beautiful. Paul explains it so clearly to the church in Rome at the time, and for you and I today, of what Christian living looks like. I am... Um, I chuckled to myself, to be honest, and I sent a, a little picture to our leaders team last night. And, uh, and we know that in the Old Testament, it says that there were 613 laws that the, that the Israelites or the people had to follow. And it was very difficult to follow those. And I've preached here before where I've said that the New Testament or the new covenant written in Jesus' blood, that the bar has been raised. For the Old Testament, it was here. It was easy for those guys, man. No, it wasn't easy. But the New Testament, the bar's been raised. 
You know that how many instructions there are for Christian living in the New Testament? Yeah, well done, God. 1,050. So if the Israelites thought, wow, it's difficult in the Old Testament to follow 613 laws, imagine, imagine trying to live out 1,050 instructions for Christian living in the New Testament. The beauty and the difference between the two is in the Old Testament they did not have Holy Spirit. And they were still separated from God. I don't want to live in the Old Testament. I want to live in the New Testament where Jesus broke that gap. He closed the gap of separation between us and God. And he released Holy Spirit permanently into your and my life. And that's why we're here today. We absolutely love the Old Testament. Don't get me wrong. But we don't live there. I don't follow David, I don't follow Moses, I don't follow Abraham. No matter who he was and how good he was, I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. And so for that reason, the new covenant that was written, the new contract for you and I, the new covenant that was written in Jesus' blood is what I want to follow, is what I want to adhere to and what I want to subscribe to. So if you've got your Bibles open to the book of Romans, chapter 5, and I'm going to read... I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. We all good? Dion, it's nice to see you. Trust that uh, shoulders come in right and uh, continue to pray for perfect healing. Thank you, Jesus. So verse 1 in chapter 5 goes like this. Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. I, I want that to settle in your mind. I want the lights to come on for you to go like, oh, wow, I get it. Listen to this. Faith Belief and trust in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to you and I. Simply because we're trusting and believing and have faith in what Jesus did. In other words, what he did on the cross, I believe, I understand, I've got trust in him. And when we do that, the Bible says God transfers his righteousness to you and I. And he now declares you and I flawless in his sight. Say, I am flawless. You know what flawless means? Without fault. That's how God sees you. You might not be living there, but that's how God sees you. He sees you flawless and without fault. That's how God sees you. Oh, how sweet it is to be loved by Jesus. If it was left up to me or to you, we'd be floundering in our sin and our despair and hopelessness. Oh, how sweet it is to be loved by Jesus. It goes on in verse 1, it says, this means that we can now enjoy true, lasting peace with God, all because of what Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. That's what he has done for us. You are declared flawless in the face of God, in the sight of God, in the presence of God. He sees you without fault. That's what Jesus did on the cross for you and I. Reconciling us to the Father means that God now sees you and I as flawless. I need that to settle in your heart and in your mind. I want you now to go to verse 8. Romans 5 verse 8. I love this. My, my, my title for this morning is the same as last Sunday, The Perfect Love of God. Now read verse 8 with me. It says, Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. I'm going to stop there for a moment. I'm going to read some more. But Jesus died in my place while I was still unholy and ungodly. He died for those who don't yet know Jesus. Not just for you and I who have said yes to him. He died for every single person. And every person, whether they know Jesus or not, is flawless in the eyes of God. That is the real you and I. Many of us still want to live in our sinful nature, and we still want to live the old life, but God actually says, no, don't do that. That's not who you are. That's not your real self. The real you is the one that I've created, the one I've loved, the one I've called, the one who I see as flawless. That's the real you. When you kick the dog and you fight with your wife, no, that's not the real you. 
No, don't do that. That's not, what you, that's not who you are. The real you is flawless in my sight. Verse 9. Verse 8 is the passionate love of Christ. He died in our place. The perfect love of God. Verse 9. And there is still much more to say of this unfailing love that Jesus or God has for us. For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard this powerful declaration. Through the blood of Jesus, we've heard this powerful declaration. This is what God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit declares over you this morning. He declares this. He says, you are now righteous in my sight. Say, I am righteous in the sight of God. That's how he sees you. That's the real you. God sees you as righteous. Powerful declaration. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God again. For those of you who think God gets angry with you, read Romans chapter 5. You will never experience the anger of God. New covenant. New covenant. Written in Jesus' blood, he says, I will never ever be angry with you again. If you think you've done something wrong and that God is angry with you, I want to change your theology this morning because that is incorrect. Bible tells me that he will never ever be angry with you and I again. Oh, how sweet it is to be loved by Jesus. Some of the stupid things that we do, and he still loves us. And he is not an angry God. It's not the God I serve. God I serve, he says to me that I will never, you will never experience my wrath again. God does not get angry with you and I. Incorrect theology. So if while we were still enemies or sinners to God, while we were still sinners, he already reconciled us to the Father. I mean, that just, that just blows my mind if you give it some thought. While I was still a sinner, Before I said yes to Jesus, he'd reconciled me to himself, considered me flawless, and considered me righteous. That's already before I said yes to him. The Bible says that the truth will set you and I free. And I want us to be free, to understand the real you. The real you is not the one who kicks the dog and screams at the cat. The real you is not the one that flares up quickly when, the, when you get a letter in the post or an email and it says that you owe so much on the taxes. You don't like, oh, that's not the real you. The real you, the real you, the way God sees you, is flawless, without fault, and righteous. You and I need to start living the real you. It goes on in verse 11. It says, and even more than that, we overflow with triumphant joy and our new relationship of living reconciled to God. All of this because of Jesus. Romans chapter 5. Beautiful picture of how God sees you and I. One of the greatest challenges that you and I have as Christians or as, as followers of Jesus Christ is to see ourselves the way God sees us. It's one of the most, the, the, the greatest challenge is for you and I to see ourselves the way God sees us. You might have read, read Romans 5 with me now and you go, whoa, William, I just, I just don't see it. Eh? Goth, do you need some water? I'm sorry, but I'm not being rude. You sure? We can get somebody to grab. You sure? I just want to help you. This is family, remember? So the whole idea for you and our friends is that we start to live in our true self. You see, I'm not just William who has the privilege of leading a church in Craddock. I'm a son of God. I'm flawless. I'm righteous. I'm reconciled to the Father. I'm found in Him. My habitation, the place I live, is in Christ. That's the real me. This week I was again just saying, in my, while I was <coughs> spending time with the Lord, I was saying that I want to continue every day just to align myself with Holy Spirit. That means I align my spirit, my soul, and my body to function the way God wanted me to. In other words, I don't allow this physical body to rule my life. This physical body doesn't rule me, doesn't lead me. My soul does not lead me. I'm not led by my emotions. I'm not led by my thoughts. I'm not led by my intellect. 
God's given me those things to fulfill a task, but it doesn't lead me. What leads me is my spirit. And I want to be led by my spirit. My spirit in alignment with the spirit of God so that as he talks to me, I can tell my soul, my mind and my body what to do. And so for you and I to start realizing and understanding who we are in Christ because of his perfect love for us, it means I bring my body in alignment, I bring my soul in alignment, and I say, Holy Spirit, lead my spirit. I want my spirit to lead me, which means in every decision I have in life, every decision I face, what school to send my kids to, I don't think of it because I'm clever or because I've done a whole lot of research. I say, Holy Spirit, what do you say? I let my spirit lead me, and then I tell my soul what to do. You see, it's an upside-down view of thinking if you consider it the way the world looks at stuff. The way the world sees it is totally different. God says, I've created you different. I've pulled you out of the world. I've set your feet on the rock. I want you to start thinking differently, and I want you to start living your true self. Not what the world says you are. Wives, not what your husband thinks you should be. Husbands, not what your wife wants you to be. Start living your true self. Live who God created you to be. You are flawless, you are righteous, and you are reconciled to the Father. You are in Christ Jesus. That is your place of habitation. That is where you live. And if you live from that place, you'll start to see the world differently. And you'll start to function differently. And you'll deal with problems and circumstances that come your way differently. Because you're not going to think like the world. You're not going to allow your soul to, to move you and to, to lead you. You're going to get to before God and say, Holy Spirit, what do I do? Let your spirit lead you. So I want to encourage you, when we surrender and yield to God on a daily basis, Lord, today I surrender to you. When I yield to you on a daily basis, it is the same as me saying, when I surrender and yield, Lord, it is to bring my body, soul, and the spirit into alignment. Because I don't want my soul to lead me. I don't want my body to lead me. Paul says he beats his body. I don't think he literally took a whip and went. I was given a whip, by the way, just as I was thinking about this. Um, Israel gave me a whip after he came back from Mozambique. And if you know my driveway at home, it's a lot of space. I'm standing at the driveway. thought I'm going to give this whip a go. Years ago, I remember whacking a whip, and I had one. You know? Anyway, so it's about 30 years later, I get this whip from Israel. I'm standing in the driveway, and I go, Wah! Yes! <laughs> Gee, did I wind myself, eh? So I don't think Paul was whipping himself. But Paul says, I beat my body, and I bring it into submission. In other words, I don't allow this body to, to rule my life. I don't allow my soul, my thinking, my intellect to rule my life. I allow the Spirit to lead me. Is that good? So when Jesus hung on the cross in John chapter 19, verse 30, the Bible says that Jesus cried out, it is finished. You remember that? He says, it is finished. You know what Jesus was actually saying? He wasn't saying, okay, I've done what I've had to do. I'm nailed to the cross. I'm about to die. It's finished. No, Jesus wasn't saying that. What he was saying, he says, everything that was stolen has been restored. Everything that was lost has been restored. It is finished. That's what Jesus did. He says the gap that separated us from God has now been closed. It is finished. And that's what I love. So what was finished? What was restored to you and I? That's the question I want to ask. Considering the perfect love of God, what was lost? What was restored to mankind? And now obviously we have to go back to the book of Genesis. And the first word in the, in the Bible, the book of Genesis, it says, in the beginning. In the Hebrew Bible, it says, Bereshet. Bereshet literally means in the head. So when Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27 says that you and I were created in the image of God, it literally means you and I were the thought of God. That he thought of us in his imagination and in his thoughts, and he said, I want to create the perfect human beings. And he created you and I. Isn't that beautiful? That you and I are the image of God in human form. I want you to think about that. You're not just Christine living in Craddock. You are the image of the living God.
we are God's invention and his original thought. I want you to say that about yourself. If you've got low self-esteem, I want you to say it this morning with me. I am God's original thought. And I trust you're not saying it just because I asked you to repeat it. But you actually believe it in your heart. That you are God's original thought. Can I tell you that you're not the invention of your parents? You know that, eh? You're not the invention of your parents. You are God's masterpiece. Say that. I am God's masterpiece. That's who you are. That's who you are. When mankind was created, Adam and Eve lived in intimate friendship with God. That's where they lived. Intimate friendship with God. They lived on earth as it is in heaven. That's how Adam and Eve lived. In absolute oneness, it's total connection. Connection was never broken between them and God and in eternal peace with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's how Adam and Eve lived in the garden. In absolute oneness, permanent connection. Connection was never, ever broken, and they lived in complete and total peace with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In John chapter 4, the Bible says that Jesus said, I must go to prepare a place for you. You remember that scripture? You know that it's not Jesus hasn't gone to heaven for 2,000 years while he's busy working on preparing a place for us. You know that, eh? That's not what it is. So when he says, I must go to prepare a place for you, means he needed to go and prepare himself for the death because his death opened a door for you and I to be reconciled to the Father. And that's what Jesus was doing. You know what Jesus did when he, when he, when he died on the cross? The door opened for you and I to return home. To return home. Adam and Eve lived in perfect bliss with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the early days of Genesis, as recorded. And when Jesus died on the cross, he reconnected you and I to the Father, reconnected us. Right now, you are in permanent connection with the Father. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He cannot change. It's not in his nature to change. And therefore, he will never, ever be separated from you again. Never. But you and I can separate ourselves from God. And we do that through sin. We do that in Luke chapter 8. It talks about how we can do it for the, for the pleasures of this world, through the problems and the worries and the cares of this world, we can separate ourselves from God and even from the riches of this world. We are attracted to the riches of this world, we can separate ourselves from God. Luke chapter 8 tells me that. But what happens is that in Ephesians 2 verse 10, it's also a beautiful picture. It says that you and I are engineered by God's design. You are engineered by God's design. We are His workmanship. Created in him to do good works. He says that we are God's poetry. Who loves poetry just out of interest? Ted does. Come on, Ted, I know you do. A couple of us. I also love poetry. You are God's poetry. Like he writes a love poem about you and I. And I think it's one of the most difficult things for men to understand is this depth of love that God has for us. But when you grasp it, when you grasp it, when you understand it, when you catch hold of it, it'll change your life forever because you won't see yourself the same. In the beginning, in God's original design, there were no sickness, there was no anxiety, there was no quarreling, there was no striving, and there was no death. Mankind was created to live in perfect harmony with God. But God also created man with a choice to choose, to make a choice. And today, even though I'm reconciled to the Father, even though He sees me as righteous and flawless and without fault, I still have a choice to live my true self or to live myself according to my sinful nature or according to the way the world says I should live. I still have a choice. And the choice that Adam and Eve made to bite of that apple and to break connection with God caused not only separation, but it also caused you and I to be left out in the cold without a home. And Jesus' death on the cross said, I have now opened the door for you and I to return home. It's a beautiful picture. I wanted to try and 
illustrated with chairs, and, uh, and then I was contemplating how else I think I'm going to just use people. Is that okay? Paul and Yara, can you please come and stand here with me? Just come and stand here. I need, um, who looks like Abraham? John, I think you look like Abraham. Come stand here, please. He's an Abraham and Moses all in one, okay? Stand over there for me. Paul and Yara, just a little bit to your left. You just a little bit this way. Go stand over here somewhere. Now I need somebody to come and stand here. Now I'm not going to say that you're a Jesus. I'm going to call you a Paul. How's that? So uh, Dion Gerber, come. So you're nodding your head and smiling. And so Dion is going to come. Dion is Paul, okay? So this is Abraham. What was Abraham's real name, by the way? Not Abram, and then Abraham. What was his real name? How did God see him? How did God see Abraham? The father of many nations. That was his real name. So he is father of many nations. So imagine Sarah coming home. She doesn't call him Abraham or Abram anymore. She says, uh, father of many nations. Are you angry? Remember earlier this year we were talking about going to your place with God and asking him, how does he see you? Hey? Eh? And then he gives you a word. That's your real name. That's how God sees you. I'm going to use these guys in a minute. Isn't it lovely? Look how handsome these bunch are. Huh? Okay. Yara's not handsome. She's beautiful. Okay, so Adam and Eve in the garden. Put your arm around each other like you loving each other and loving God and really enjoying the peace and the oneness with the, with the Father. Okay, so this is what it would look like when they lived in absolute harmony, in peace, in total connection with God, no separation, beautiful time. Doesn't it look beautiful? Yeah, come. Only two people think it's beautiful. Come on, this is good, eh? Adam and Eve, original design. Okay, cool. Then we know that they sinned. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Maybe it's Paul's beard, I don't know. Okay, so we know that they sinned. What happened then, at, when they sinned, it caused separation between them and God. Kicked out of the garden, we know all that, thorns and thistles. If you've got thorns on your farm, steer cluss in your sheep, blame Adam and Eve, okay? It was their fault. Because when God created, the Bible says there was no thorns and thistles. How's that, eh? When, the man, when man fell, go and read Genesis, it says now there'll be weeds and thorns and thistles. So steer cluss, Adam's fault. You can blame him, okay? So all of a sudden, Adam and Eve are not happy living in absolute perfect harmony with God, and they choose to sin because they've got a free will. Choose to sin. Causes separation between God and man. From Genesis to the time of Moses, this is a Moses and an Abraham, to the time of Moses, 2,500 years, where sin came into the world. And people started to do all kinds of things, sexual immorality, murder. Remember Moses, he murdered someone as well. All those things, Israelites into captivity. 2,500 years of separation from God. Holy Spirit only came on one or two of the people, like a Moses, to do the work that God had called him to do. Amazing, eh? Then there was Abraham, father of many nations. And so the father of many nations and Moses were given a law and this whole thing of the minor prophets. And from the time of Adam and Eve, we understand the Bible says it's about 4,000 years, 4,000 years to when Jesus came. Jesus, yeah, this is Paul, eh? Jesus came. 4,000 years of eternal separation from God, not living in oneness with the Father anymore, totally separated from God, living in sin, allowing the enemy of this world to dictate how you should live, bringing all kinds of sin into the world, 4,000 years of it, all because Adam and Eve weren't happy living in perfect harmony with God. They made a choice, made a choice. You and I today have a choice. Exactly the same as the choice that faced Adam and Eve every single second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month, you and I have a choice. We can either choose to live our true self the way God sees us or we choose to, to live the way the world says. We choose the enemy's thoughts. 4,000 years of eternal separation from God. Jesus came. And when he hung on the cross, he says, it is finished. The gap that was created from sin is now closed. That gap is closed. Why do we want to live here? <laughs> I don't want to live here. 
I want to learn from Abraham and the minor prophets. And there's a lot of prophetic words that were spoken in this time that are relevant today. Absolutely. And those are the words that I want to follow. And David, when he wrote the Psalms and the Proverbs and Song of Solomons, I love those books. And I want to look, but I'm not going to live the way Moses did or live the way Abraham did. I'm going to live the way Jesus told me to live. Isn't that beautiful? Because in this place, when Jesus came, the eternal separation was broken, that gap was closed. No more are you and I separated from God. He now sees you righteous, flawless, and constantly and permanently connected to the Father again. From here, Jesus, what did he say it was finished? He restored our original design. Isn't that beautiful? So when we speak healing over people, we speak original design. You've heard me say it many times, original design. What did it look like before sin? Father, that's where we want to live. And Jesus restored that back to mankind again. And he said, come and live with me in the garden. And yet you and I can still choose to be out of the garden. It doesn't make sense. eh? does not make sense to me. You guys can go sit down. Thank you. Appreciate it. Give them a hand. I think they were... uh, Great examples of uh, Adam and Eve and Moses, Abraham, and Paul. Thank you for your your help, guys. John 3.16, we know it. What does it say? John 3.16. That he gave. That he gave. It's not by works. It's not because you're handsome or beautiful or clever or intelligent, it's got nothing to do with your works, he gave out of the generosity of his own heart to say, actually, I want to reconcile man back to, who, back to myself. And Jesus' death on the cross closed the gap and brought you and I back. We can now stand. We can now stand flawless, righteous, and permanently connected to the Father. Our habitat, our home is in Christ Jesus. The Bible tells me that. That's where I am. I function from that place. That is my true self. When I'm led by my spirit, not my soul, not my emotions, not my intellect, I start to function the way Jesus wanted me to function. That's perfect love. That's the perfect love of Jesus. Perfect love. Going fine. Gary. He doesn't. He doesn't make people suffer, Gary. We still live in a fallen world. You see, if you allow your emotions to rule you, you're going to ask God, why does he make people suffer? When you understand that your position in Christ is flawless, righteous, then you know your wife is flawless, righteous, and holy before the Father. You know that. So we don't allow our emotions, and I'm not being unkind, but we don't allow our emotions to rule. We bring our spirit and our soul and our body into alignment, and we say, God, why? Holy Spirit, show me. And when he shows you, when Holy Spirit shows you, then you can walk in the righteousness that he provides. Does it mean that there's not going to be any problems and that you're not going to face disease and illness? No, of course not. But remember, God sees you as flawless, righteous, and he sees your wife, Gary. He sees you as flawless, righteous, and reconciled to him. That's how he sees her. Remember, you and I are spirit beings. We are in human form, but I'm a spiritual being, and my spirit communicates with the Father. When you and I die physically, it's this physical body that dies, and I'll be happy when this physical body dies, and I've still got work to do, but when this physical body, full of its sickness and illness and disease, when it dies, I know that my spirit is alive with Christ, and that's where we will live for eternity, and how we will live for eternity. Gary, I'm not being heartless. I promise you I'm not. I love you, my brother, I do. But God does not bring suffering. The enemy has. 
We, the hardest thing for you and I to do is to make sure we are not led by our emotions. And that's why on a daily basis we have to say, Lord, I surrender to you. Because it's so easy for my intellect, my thoughts, my imagination, my emotions to rule my life. I say, God, I want to be ruled by you. I'd love to pray with you afterwards, Gary. One of the greatest challenges, as I said to you earlier on, is for you and I to see ourselves the way God sees us. It's one of the greatest challenges because we often think I'm unworthy. No, surely not me. You know, look at the stuff I've done in my past. If I have to tell you, and I've told some of you some of my story in the past, if you looked at my story in my past, you'd say, Flip William, how can you be standing there? And I know it's because of the grace of God. But I also know that's not the real me. The real me is the one who God created me to be. And when I'm led by my spirit, I start to function the way God called me to function. And I don't function the way the world expects me to function. You and I have got to be different. Elreen said it this morning, we're called out. That's what a Christian means, a called out ones. We are called out of this world to be different, like a sore thumb. You and I need to stick out like a sore thumb. That's what God wants you and I to do. Stick out like a sore thumb so you can be attractive to people and get them to come and be you know, their true selves like you and I are today. The greatest challenge for you and our friends is to see ourselves the way God sees us. But you know what God has done? He's, he's equipped you and I to be attractive evidence. When I, when I, when I read that this morning, on, on Friday morning, I was actually just sitting in my office and I just started weeping, eh? Because I am attractive evidence of God. Sometimes I'm like, yes, Lord, how do you see me like that, you know? But he sees me as attractive evidence of who he is. I am his exact representation here on earth. You know, when I start to think of it in my, from my soul, it just doesn't make sense. And I go like, whoa, Lord, how do you see me like that? But when I start to allow my spirit to lead me, Wow, then there's just this beautiful picture that opens of me seated with Christ in heavenly places. And I function from that place of rest and that place of peace. And all of a sudden, my soul comes into mind, comes into line. And my emotions are regathered. But I sat there on Friday morning when he just said to me, you are attractive evidence of my goodness and my grace and my glory in your life. I just started weeping. That's who you and I are. You are attractive evidence of who God is. Bible says that you and I are image bearers. We bear the image of Christ. It means that you and I reflect the likeness of Christ. That's your true self. That's who God has done. That's who Jesus died for. That's who he, he reconciled you to the Father. That's how he sees you and I. Our true self is image bearers. The likeness of Jesus. Attractive evidence of God. That's who you are. No, you're not the one that's stuck with an addiction and you don't know how to get out of it. That's not your true self. Bring your body and your soul and your spirit into alignment and all of a sudden we start to live our true self. Abraham, his real name, father of many nations. What is your real name? What does God call you? The beautiful, and I've told you and I've I've said it before that that God calls me a transformer. I quite like it. eh? But... Imagine walking around and, and don't call me pastor, please, because you, you know that, eh? Matthew 26, don't call me pastor. Please don't ever do that. The Bible says don't call anyone pastor, rabbi, teacher. Don't, because you've only got one pastor, or rabbi, or teacher, and that's your father in heaven. So don't ever call me that, because I'm nowhere near that. But I am transformer. So if you want to call me something instead of William, you can say, hey, transformer, and I'll probably respond. But you you understand what I'm trying to say here. When you understand your true identity, how God sees you, when you see how God sees you, your life will change. It really will. And you'll start to live in your true self, who God's called you to be. I quoted 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 13, sorry, last week. And we all should know it off by heart. 1 Corinthians 13. Say it louder, please, Lisa. Yeah, yeah, come on. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not proud. And it's not rude. It's not rude. It's not rude. Love does not demand its own way. It's love. 
It's not irritable. Did you get up in the morning and your wife says, no, maybe you've got to get out the wrong side of the bed. Get back in the bed. Get out the right side. Change your attitude. Eh? Love is not irritable and it keeps no record of wrong. Oh, but you did this to me last week. And it's your fault I am where I am because, no, rubbish. Remember Jeannie's preaching or her teaching on the powerless and the powerful person? Love is powerful. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures to the end. If I believe that God is love, then I can rephrase that scripture and say God is patient and kind. God is not jealous, he's not boastful, he's not proud, and God is not rude. He does not demand his own way. Gee, that is, that is amazing when you think of it that way. God does not demand his own way. He still gives you enough free choice. Love, God never gives up. He never loses faith. He's always hopeful, and he endures through every circumstance. If I believe that I'm found in Christ, then I can also read this as, I am patient. And I am kind. That is the real you. 1 Corinthians 13. I am not jealous. I'm not boastful. I'm not proud. And I'm not rude. I don't demand my own way. I'm not irritable. I keep no record of being wronged. But three years ago, you lied and cheated and stole and you did this and I'm struggling to let it go. Love. The perfect love of God enables you and I not to keep a record of wrong. It says that I do not rejoice with injustice, but I rejoice with the truth. I never give up. I don't lose faith. I don't lose hope. And I will always endure through all circumstances. Gary, I will endure through all circumstances because of the perfect love of God. That is what he has done for us. You see, it's not positive thinking, and I'm not trying to convince myself or you, but that is my true identity. And I want to live in my true identity. And that is founded in the perfect love of, love of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16 to 18 says, All of us who have had the veil removed, the veil of misunderstanding, the veil of incorrect thinking, the veil of wrong religion and theology, when that veil has been removed, we can see and reflect the glory of God. And that's what Jesus did. He came and he removed the veil, the thing that covered you and my eyes so we don't see the truth. He lifted it up and he says, for those who have the veil removed, you can now see and reflect the glory of God in every circumstance. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it also goes on, it says, and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him makes us more and more like him, and we reflect the features of Jesus Christ. Can you just believe that and understand that your true self is someone who's reflecting the true features of Jesus Christ? That's who you are. It's your place of work, Joseph in the bank. You are reflecting Jesus Christ in the way you speak, eat, deal with people. I, said that, I might have said it here the other day, but I, I happened to go to FNB Bank about two weeks ago, 10 days ago. And we all know that Joseph's the bank manager, and he's outside and he's picking a blitter off the road. He's picking a blitter off the pavement. You see, when we understand love, when we understand love, I don't demand my own way. Beautiful. But we sometimes we prefer the world to shape us, and we prefer the world to dictate how we should live. The hardest thing for you and I to do, friends, is to, to see ourselves the way God sees us. It's one of the most difficult things to do because my soul constantly gets in the way. And I constantly got to bring it back into, into alignment, say, no, I'm not going to be led by my intellect or my thoughts or my imagination or my history. No, no, bring it back into alignment. God, what do you say? Over this issue that I'm facing, what do you say, God? Because that's when I'll live in peace and I'll live in oneness with God again. I mentioned it last week and I want to finish off with this and then we're going to sing a song and we're going to, we're going to just do a little bit of ministry if I may. But um, I said it to you last week that in the book of Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came on, we all know Acts chapter 2 quite well. It's the day of Pentecost when Holy Spirit came upon the church and they all spoke in tongues. 
And, uh, and the Bible goes on and Peter starts to preach. It's a beautiful preach. He gets up at the verse 10, I think it is, and he starts to preach. And at the end of his preach, 3,000 people get saved. Isn't that amazing? What a beautiful thing for you and I to go preach somewhere and just to see 3,000 people come to Christ. I'd love to see that. But the last verse that, Paul, that Peter mentions in his, in his preach, he says that the same God who you crucified, now remember you and my sin crucified Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago. It's quite weird to get your head around that, eh? Like, what did I have to do with guys 2,000 years ago? No, no, don't let your soul rule you. Let your spirit rule. And because Psalm 139 says to me that before I was even born, before I was even conceived in my mother's womb, God knew me. So he knew me before. It says that the Bible says that God knew you before time began. Like, <laughs> he knew that in 2023, you and I would be sitting in this building today speaking about him. He knew. Before he created heavens and earth. Isn't that amazing? Why am I telling you all this? Oh, yes. Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit comes on them. Peter preaches. 3,000 get saved. And this is the last thing that Peter says. He says, the same Christ that you crucified, God has made him to be Lord and Christ. And I've often wondered, so what is the difference between Lord and Christ? And Lord means master. So God has made him to be your new master. So when you say yes to Jesus, you're actually giving yourself to a new master, which means it is no longer I who live, it is Christ who lives in me. It is no longer I who live, I'm not dictated to by the world, it is not my soul and my emotions that live any longer, I am now live, I'm alive because of the power of Christ in me. He is my new Lord. I do not bow to the news 24 or ENCA or the ANC government. I don't look at what is happening around the world and say, this is going to shape my life. And no, no, I'm shaped by the kingdom of God. God has called you and I to be different, stand out like a sore thumb and let people be attracted to the Christ in you. So good. Eh? My old self has been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2 verse 20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body, earthly, because it'll be gone. I live in this earthly body, but trusting in the Son of God, who loved me, perfect love of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself for me so that I can be reconciled to him, and then now he considers me flawless and righteous. That is my true self. And that's where I want you and I to live in our true self. I don't want us to live dictated to by the world. Now the world says, if you do this to me, then I'm going to feel this. We've often spoken about offense. And my joke is, if you want to take offense, take the gate as well. You might as well. Take the whole thing. Take, take everything. Your, your problems, you deal with it. So we don't take offense. You know that fence is not given. Fence is taken. And so we don't want to take offense. And that is being led by your soul and your spirit and your mind. I want, sorry, your soul and your mind. I want to be led by the Spirit of God. Father, what do you say? Jacques has said something like really horrible. He hasn't. I'm just using an example. Jacques has said something like really nasty to me. I have a choice. Do I take offense? But I say, Holy Spirit, what do I do? You know what Jesus did? Father, I just release grace and I release mercy over that person, and I just speak life into them, that they will see their true self and not live according to the flesh. No, oh, it's amazing. Eh? I want to finish with this. Jesus restored, when he said it is finished, he restored your and my true identity. Our original design, Paul and Yara, our original design, God, Jesus restored that back to you and I. And that's the perfect love of God. The perfect love of God. The challenge is for you and I to believe it and start living in it. That's the challenge. Because you wake up tomorrow morning and you've been led by your soul and your spirit, your mind and your intellect again. And you've got to come back and say, whoa, hold on. Come back to this place. Spirit, lead me. We sing the song, Spirit, lead me. Remember that song by Michael Ketra? It was a beautiful one. We sang it quite a lot last year. Spirit, lead me. That's what you and I want, is to be led by the Spirit. We know that the Bible says those who are led by the Spirit of God are? Thank you, Goth. Well done. Those who are led by the Spirit of God. You and I need to be led by the Spirit of God, not what's happening in Craddock, 
not what's happening in our province or in our nation, led by the Spirit of God. And that's what Jesus came, to bring us reconciliation. You are no longer separated from God. You know that. There's nothing you can do now to separate yourself from God ever again. Nothing. You can be out of connection with God, but there's nothing you can do to separate yourself from God because it's not in you to do that. It's not your right to do it. It's His, and He's chosen to be permanently, constantly connected to you, never ever to be, let, to be separated. Last two things, and then we're going to stand. The perfect love of God restored everything that was lost by first Adam. The perfect love of God restored everything that first Adam lost. Jesus, second Adam, second chance, cancelled all the separation, everything that was against us, cancelled it all, and reconciled us back to the Father. And he now sees you flawless, blameless, innocent, reconciled, and permanently in connection with him. That's your true self.